Hello, friends. Um, my good friends at uh, Fuller, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you uh, on the mission and the vision of the world as God's home. Uh, Fuller, as some of you may know, holds a very dear place in my uh, experience, my heart. Um, I was a student at Fuller. I was teaching also uh, at Fuller for some seven seven years. And this has have been um, uh, very happy years of uh, my life with great friends and uh, working for such a wonderful institution that Fuller, Fuller uh, was and that Fuller continues uh, to be. So my delight uh, is to be able to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this conference. Uh, topic, as you see, is mission and the vision of the world as God's uh, home. Before I delve into my uh, lecture, I want to make a few introductory remarks. Obviously, the topic of mission is big, and I will be able to address only one aspect of uh, mission. But this aspect, one aspect that I'll address, is really the key to any theology of mission, uh, namely the question of the goal of uh, mission. Um, and the premise with which I will be working is that the mission of the church is the mission of God. The church is a result of the mission of God, and the church also participates in the mission of God. Or you can put it slightly differently, and I won't go into that in the lecture itself. The mission of the church is the mission of Jesus Christ. It's identical with his mission. What Jesus, word the word incarnate, did in the power of the Spirit, the disciples are commanded and also empowered uh, to do. So that you can think of the church as the continuation of Christ's mission in the power of the Spirit. Uh, God's mission, obviously, and Christ's mission align, uh, and also uh, our Christian uh, church's mission aligns with this as well. Uh, that also implies that the mission and the identity of the church are the two sides of one and the same reality. So um, I mentioned that I will speak about the goal of, of mission, and I want to summarize the goal of that mission with the promise of God's home. God's home is the goal of God's mission in the world. And you can see that fairly easily when if you look at the very last um, vision in the book of Revelation, very last book of the, of the Christian Bible. Um, and in that vision, you have the end of God's ways with the world. And the text of Revelation reads like this. When I saw a new heaven, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among humans. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, death will be no more, Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Now, this is the promise of God's home. It's a vision of new heavens and a new earth. And this is an echo of the book of Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, 17, for I am about to create new heavens and new earth. That's now becoming a reality. That's what John sees. But then, interesting enough, there's also an interpretation of that vision, and that vision is expressed in terms of home of God. Um, behold, the home of God uh, is among mortal, and that interpretation is the inter interpretation by the divine voice from the throne itself. Um, and that picks up the strand of Exodus, um, book of Exodus, Exodus 29, 45, I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God. So the entire movement of God in relation to Israel was God's dwelling with Israel and being their God. The entire movement of God and the mission, therefore, of God with the world 
is God dwelling, making home among uh, human uh, beings. So reading this Bible as a whole, we can say that the purpose of God in creating the world is for God to make the world God's home and home of all God's creatures together. And the mission of the church can be then no other than to participate in just this mission of God. There's a long tradition, of course, of thinking about the goal of creation, goal of human beings above all, being home. Uh, in the Bible, in the Gospel of uh, Luke, one of the most famous uh, stories that Jesus ever told, parables, is the parable of the prodigal son who is returning back to father's home. And that becomes then the metaphor of a journey of the whole of humanity back to God. Or you can think of Abraham on the way to the city whose builder is God. Again, that city is home. And among the great uh, theologians of the past, Augustine was the one who picked up that image and worked it, uh, worked it out. And he worked it out in a particular way. He made a powerful argument that God is human's home, proper human's home, and the world is a foreign land in which we need, which we need to. A travel through and then eventually leave in order to return back to God. <clears throat> now, the presentation of the God's goal with humanity uh, that we just read in the book of Revelation is, I think, very different than the one that Augustine uh, gives and the one that has dominated, I think, the Christian tradition for many centuries. Purpose of, of God in creating the world is not for humans to leave the world to be united with God, but for God to make the world into God's and creatures' uh, home. Uh, so is God the final end, or is the creation God's final? And that is the question. And the other aspect of that question is um, well, what uh, what image properly corresponds to this idea, this purpose of God. And one tradition has um, fairly influential, especially in recent years, traditions ha has said that it's the kingdom. Uh, kingdom is the guiding image. Um, in the Revelation, as we'll see, um, all will rule with Christ. So that the kingdom of God may be a kingdom of kings, then, uh, and in that sense, the image kind of undoes itself. At the same time, also, temple has been suggested uh, as an alternative way to think about uh, that image with it, that I call a home, the end of God with humanity. But in the, the book of Revelation, God himself is the temple. So I'm suggesting, uh, and I build on some work that we have done here at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture in this regard, that the metaphor of home is uh, very useful for us to think about what God's end in creating the world is, and therefore what Christian mission is. So um, now, if that is in any case, in any way plausible, uh, to you, then the next question that comes uh, before us is, what is home? How do we imagine home? What is that? And obviously, many of us have all sorts of experiences uh, with home. Some are extraordinary, beautiful experiences. Others have a, uh, deeply troubled experiences with home. And just like the prodigal, many of us, even when we were not prodigal, even maybe because we were not prodigals, could hardly wait to leave home because home itself has unhomed itself and become an oppressive, oppressive place. But nonetheless, the image, positive image, is also there. And it's on that that I want to draw. Now, um, by, by home, I mean... Uh, material and social space, which is to say not just a building or an apartment, but also a social place, that is to say, relations of people who live at that uh, given uh, given place. And home can have a wider uh, sense, also hometown, uh, home country as well. And, and many people speak these days 
about whole earth actually being our home, especially in ecological discussion, that has become a very prominent uh, idea. So social, material, and social space that endures over time. It's not just the space that you may come for a moment and then leave, uh, like a hotel room might be, but that endures and that you have a relationship with over a period of time. Um, one more important thing needs to be said about home, and that is that, that home is not a set of things uh, or entities, uh, some um, animate others, uh, inanimate, but that the home is actually a set of relations, uh, relations between things and between people, people and of people to things. And I think the, some of the most uh, significant relationships that define home is uh, 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 one of them is idea of resonance. Things at home resonate with us. We recognize them. They speak to us. They're not kind of dead things that we observe or even very interesting things that we observe, but we have a kind of this deeper relationship and they speak to us and we obviously also speak uh, to, uh, to them as well. Uh, the second feature is an attachment. We have a particular kind of attachment then to, to home. If we were to lose home, uh, we have a, a, a kind of longing to, uh, to return, to reconstitute uh, a, a home. It, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of emotional tie, and that is expressed often in the idea of belonging. We belong to home. We are constitutive elements uh, of home, and we belong as part of, uh, part of uh, home, and home belongs, belongs to us. And final um, aspect of the relationships uh, and set of relations that describe home that I want to emphasize is mutuality. Now, for me to be at home in a given place, uh, somehow these other folks who are part of that home have to think that I belong to home. <laughs> uh, it's a kind of mutual relationship. If you don't think that I don't belong to home, I probably won't feel that I belong to home either because this mutuality of resonance, of attachment, mutuality of belonging, that also all defines uh, home as uh, as such. So that's a very rough sketch of what home uh, is. So let me just uh, do a, a bit of summary and the prospect of what's gone so far and where we are headed. And so far, I've sketched the goal uh, of God's mission with the world to be and identified it as a home. Uh, and next, I want to explore some neglected obstacles to its realization. And then finally... I'll address the question of goal, on which I will spend quite a bit of time examining the contrast between the two cities in the book of Revelation, uh, Babylon and the New Jerusalem. What I will not do in this lecture and cannot do in this lecture is to tell the story of God's mission, which in many ways looks like a story of everything God creates and the history goes and finally comes to an end, which is the goal of God's mission. Now, as it turns out, I'm right now finishing together with Ryan McAnally Lintz, who works uh, here at the center, at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture as well, a book called The Home of God, a brief story of almost uh, everything. And I'll sketch that, uh, we'll sketch that, a large story of everything uh, in that book. Um, also, what I will skip is a kind of specific vision of human flourishing that corresponds to that story. I've tried to develop that, uh, at least in a rudimentary way, in the book For the Life of the World, which I wrote together with Matt Crossman. And that kind of, in that book, there is kind of basic idea is how human beings need to, what, 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 what the basic idea of human flourishing of human fullness might look like that corresponds to the story of everything, that is to say, to the story of God's mission in the world. Now, these things belong together, uh, and to understand properly each one of them, especially to understand the vision of human flourishing, we need to situate it in the story of everything. And just a, a quick reminder that when a person becomes a Christian, 
that basically, uh, if you think of that act as fundamentally being expressed in baptism, and if baptism takes place in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the, the name of the Trinity, and then when you ask who that God is, uh, you end up saying God is the creator uh, who uh, came in Jesus Christ to redeem and who through the Holy Spirit will bring the creation to completion. You've told the story of everything when you have confessed the faith and been uh, baptized. Now, that all can be, of course, developed in, in great detail, but that belongs also to the mission uh, of the church Unfortunately, time is short and uh, the lecture is uh, only one. Uh, so I will uh, go to some of the questions, obstacles to realization of home, uh, and then emphasize the goal of uh, mission, uh, goal of God uh, with the world. So uh, a bit of what one might describe an unhomed uh, world. We often do feel at home in places, um, in many, many places, but very often we also do not feel at home in places, places that should be our homes. A re resonance, attachment, belonging, and mutuality, mutuality are often undermined, and undermined by many things. Um, what comes immediately to mind uh, is something like ingratitude. Uh, and the reason why I mention that is that if you read the book of, Revel uh, or, or, um, the book of Romans, uh, Apostle Paul thinks that the original home of human beings, uh, Garden of Eden, was undermined most profoundly by the sense of ingratitude, taking for granted that which one had instead of being grateful and receiving it uh, as, as a gift. Uh, from God. The same, I think, holds true in many ways in our everyday home experiences, taking things for granted rather than being grateful for the good that they are will undo a sense of home. Or Wynn can mention, and I'll return to that later, the drive to superiority as being kind of profoundly home undermining um, uh, kind of e emotion or, 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 or tendency, um, tendency especially that's exacerbated in our culture. By superiority, I mean, it's not enough for, for us to be good at, at something. It's not enough for us to be great at something. We somehow, or at least many of us, are tempted to want to be always better than somebody else, right? So this idea of being better than uh, is the drive to superiority. Not drive to excellence, but drive to superiority. Uh, and it has all sorts of deleterious consequences because anybody who challenges uh, my vision of uh, my, my being, the, uh, being the, the best uh, superior will have to be taken, uh, taken down. Now, we, we could, we could spend quite a long time discussing some of these is issues, but I want to uh, emphasize two important but ne neglected features, especially in contemporary world, of unhoming. Uh, and that is the logic of escalation and reification. I'll explain both of these, and I draw in my analysis on the work of German sociologist by the name of Hartmut Rosa, who has written uh, a book, uh, Resonance, where he speaks uh, about some of these uh, features, but it goes back to his work on, um, on acceleration as the feature of uh, modernity. If you're interested, Resonance is a good, thick German book for you to read, some 800 pages. So uh, a little, little, little time than you have free, uh, you might devote to that, uh, that book. So um, to, to get the basic idea of this uh, escalation, um, you, you, have to, uh, you have to get a sense of what he describes as dynamic stabilization. And uh, here's, here's his definition of uh, dynamic stabilization. Modern society can only stabilize itself dynamically, or more precisely, it can only reproduce its structure through an increase of some sort, quite regularly through economic growth, 
technological acceleration or and higher rates of cultural innovation. And the basic uh, idea, I think, is that you can you can uh, illustrate it with, with an image, is uh, if you don't want to fall off from your bicycle, you need to keep pedaling. And now, now imagine that if you didn't pedal faster and faster, you would end up falling from your bicycle. Then you get a sense of this idea of dynamic stabilization. Uh, we hear that all the time, say, in economy. You've got to grow uh, or, or you're going to fall behind. Or in the academic world, pub publish or perish, and you'd have to do it constantly um, in a, in a faster way, in a kind of competitive way as, as well. And that's connected in general with uh, what Hartmut Rosa described as acceleration of the pace of life. Here's a quote about um, pace of life and time. This is perhaps, this, this is what perhaps characterizes everyday predicament of uh, overwhelming majority of people in Western capitalist societies most aptly. Amidst monetary and technological affluence, they're close to temporal insolvency. We need more time to do our work properly. We need more time to improve our skills and knowledge, to renew our hard and software. We need more time to care for our kids and elderly parents, more time for our friends and relatives, uh, for our house or flat or for our body. And finally, we need more time to come to terms with ourselves, our minds, our souls, our psyche. We do not have time. So that's the uh, a kind of uh, time is slipping from us. And that expresses this idea of, uh, of acceleration of, of time. Now, uh, an, another feature, um, uh, and that ends then this idea of, uh, of escalation, is escalation not just in pace, but in space, in the scope of our engagement. Um, and strong trend is to uh, expand the scope of our uh, reach in many ways. Um, that you see that in businesses, you see that uh, just about in all domains of of life. And uh, you have a, a a joke that has been uh, occasionally said about very busy uh, busy people uh, is uh, you know what's the difference between in, in our case was was uh, when I was a student in uh, Croatia it was Peter Kuzmic what's the difference who is the director of the of the school where I was attending what's the difference between Peter Kuzmic and God and the response to that uh, question was well God is everywhere. Um, uh, like God, Peter is every, uh, uh, everywhere, uh, but Peter is not here. So the idea that God is everywhere, but Peter is everywhere except uh, here. And this kind of sense of we are everywhere uh, except in the place where we find ourselves. And I think most of us experience that um, when we... Uh, as soon as we take our iPhones and start scrolling in the middle of, of a conversation or at any other time, we are scattered in so many different directions. So few of us, very few of us live lives with a steady focus on social and material space that is our home. Now, another um, very important feature of an unhomed world today is so-called reification. Uh, or sometimes, uh, especially in um, post-colonial discourse, uh, the, 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 the term has been anglicized uh, as thingification. Things become, or th whatever we encounter becomes reduced to mere things. In the sciences, for instance, all entities appear as, as things. They, scientists, grasp, or sciences, grasp all things from far away as if they were external to the social world and completely indifferent to human concerns. Or modern economies, market has a tendency to turn everything into commodities, goods to be bought and sold. 
Uh, the same is true, uh, at least according to some analysis, with the modern state, which tends to treat the population as its own vital uh, resource. Um, in many different ways, you can see how things, rather than being living and resonant, they become uh, dead things, means that we use to achieve certain, certain ends. Um, now, if home matters to us, we uh, will have to resist the dynamic of escalation and re reification. Or we can find some uh, form of escape, uh, and that can be, would be our only uh, option. A number of such escapes are available to people today. For instance, transhumanists, uh, it's important, marginal still, but nonetheless important uh, trend. It, Transhumanists imagine human survival in knowledge and data, right? So uh, this is this is transformation of everything into knowledge and data. Uh, super rich desire settlement in peaceful colonies in space with year-round weather like Maui on its best day. Um, uh, there's a long, long tradition of imagination and, and, and searching um, uh, for something like that. The rest of us, of course, keep a pretense of, uh, of normalcy. Uh, and that normalcy uh, tends to be then pro deeply uh, problematic, can be well illustrated in the poem Niagara, which is, is uh, to me, is a, is a very, uh, very moving and telling poem. As though the river were a floor, we position our table and chairs upon it, eat and have conversation. As it moves along, we notice as calmly as though dining room paintings were being replaced, the changing scenes along the shore. We do know, we do know this is the Niagara River, but it is hard to remember what that means. So, in some sense, you, we have a we are in the flow of, of of things, and that flow of things leads to uh, to destruction, uh, and we aren't aware of what is going on in, in our lives and uh, around us as well. Now, um, when you turn. Your uh, your attention to the Bible, you you see that that um, there's a kind of eschatological vision, is that of contrast of two cities and two kinds of uh, homes, um, and these serve on the one hand the Babylon as a kind of dystopian vision, so to speak, and then New Jerusalem as a utopian uh, vision, if you want to put it this way, except that uh, utop prophets uh, uh, and seers do not know such a thing as a utopia, because uh, utopias are no places, and for prophets, their visions are not yet places, uh, and they rest on the promise and that promises, uh, um, assured assurances are given about that promise uh, by the divine presence uh, who leads the history, God who leads the history to its uh, completion. So let me now sketch that these two cities, two possible futures uh, for for the world, uh, and uh, uh, New Jerusalem then will be a symbol, uh, in New Jerusalem, we'll see the symbol of uh, world become God's home, and Babylon is this, this oikic, unhomed form of existence. And I'll explicate those around the basic features of a home or social spaces uh, that, um, that describe, can describe a home. So in Babylon, first uh, category is rule, uh, Babylon is the world capital. It rules over the peoples and multitudes and nations and languages, and it rules by military might. It rules also by deception and seduction, so that the rule is not just based on power, but it has ideology behind it. And if it doesn't have ideology, then it has 30,000 lies in the course of four years of presidency. 
Um, second category is wealth. Uh, it is Babylon is consumed with desire for wealth, a desire it has in common with the kings and the magnates uh, over whom it rules and with whom it cooperates and trades. And the city, which is to say people, is dressed, which means fills itself with the finest of things, from gold to spices, from silk to scarlet, to horses and chariots, from pearls to ivory and ivory to frankincense and wine, from cattle to enslaved uh, people. Uh, that's a kind of Babylonian sense of, uh, of, of, of wealth. And it's kind of uh, impressive until you take a closer look uh, at the way in which that wealth has been acquired and how it's being uh, related to. The ultimate value of Babylon is... Um, is uh, it, it, it's central uh, here. Uh, decked in uh, jewels and clothed in purple and scarlet, Babylon tolerates no alternative set of values besides its obsession. And beastly is described, uh, uh, kind of Leviathan uh, is the image that uh, the writer of the book of Revelation evokes. It is obsessed with, um, uh, with power, with wealth, and with glory, the golden cup of its abominations, it holds, which it holds, is filled with the blood of the prophets and of the saints. So Babylon's throne is the scarlet beast full of blasphemous names. The city is doomed to become the dwelling place of demons. You have a sketch here of what drives it, and you have immediately then um, uh, John, uh, the seer's interpretation of, of this uh, wealth and power, and that wealth and power set against uh, the vision of who God is. Um, uh, new Jerusalem, let me contrast uh, New Jerusalem uh, first to uh, now, and that is um, most immediate contrast is seen in the character of the rule. When John envisions God and the Lamb, that is, Lamb is your Jesus Christ, ruling from the throne, they don't rule merely from outside. And they certainly don't rule by military might or with the help of deception, as Babylon does. They rule with the, from within the true selves of the people in whom they dwell. Remember, this is a dwelling place of God. The selves which have the law of love woven into their very fabric. Now, this implies that all people rule together with God, which is to say that no one rules over any, everyone, anyone else. Nations are not subdued and rob, robbed of their glory. They walk in the light of God, and they walk through the open gates they, to bring the glory and honor into that City. The idea is um, uh, of of a rule, core rule, shared rule uh, of of all. Um, some might call this an anarchic uh, vision. Um, uh, one might also describe it something like a the the anarchy, theistic anarchy. In the New Jerusalem, you have wealth. Uh, it's even more opulent that Babylon is uh, full of gold and crystal and precious stones, but nobody's getting rich by trading or at the expense of someone else, because as any in any good home, everything is equally accessible for everybody. And the water of life, which stands here for all the goods actually of life, is given as a gift. Now, uh, I didn't mention in Babylon uh, that there's uh, virtually no mention of nature. Nature is completely absent. Everything has become artificial. Uh, everything has become processed, uh, and nothing ends up being natural. The New Jerusalem is, is, of course, an urban era, and imagination, of course, is golden streets and so forth. And so forth. It's an artificial uh, space in, in that sense, but it is also a garden city. A river of the water of life flows 
from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the city. And on either side of the tree or of the river is a tree of life, and that tree is for the healing of the nation. Tree is a collective uh, noun here, uh, and some people suggest that actually every street has a uh, channel of uh, river going through it, and on each side of the river there are tree, trees that are growing. Now, when you imagine it this way, which is an argument um, that, as I said, a number of people uh, make, then you have uh, uh, an image of the Garden of Eden restored and expanded and integrated into the city or city built around, uh, around it. And this is a harmony of civilization and of uh, nature. And finally, I think it's very important to emphasize uh, the ultimate uh, value. John sees the New Jerusalem as the Holy of Holies. And you can see that from the shape of that city, which is a cube, humongous uh, cube. Uh, and uh, obviously that all points to symbolism rather than anything like a, like a literal uh, description. And it was a part of the ancient Israelite temple where God's presence rested. God dwells in it, and it dwells uh, in God. Now, Holy of Holies, if you uh, want uh, just to see the, the contrast in dimensions, Holy of Holy was 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters. Um, the New Jerusalem is 1,500 or something miles in, in each, each direction, a cube. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's imagined as, uh, as encompassing the entirety of the creation. Now, a very important thing to emphasize is that God is not external to the city. Home of God, God dwells in the home and God is present in the New Jerusalem. God is the light, of course, that shines onto the city. Uh, and that city, th that light is reflected outward. That's probably the significance of gold and crystal. Light shines on it, and it's, it's then uh, uh, reflected uh, outward. But the most interesting feature of the New Jerusalem is that light doesn't just shine on the outside into it, but God being present inside, it shines from within outside. It is refracted. And we know that, or we can, we, we can, uh, we can surmise that, because the gold and jasper uh, are translucent in the New Jerusalem. And now translucent gold is a strange phenomenon, just like translucent jasper, jasper, which is a red, opaque, semi-precious uh, stone. They, they're, they're not translucent, but in the New Jerusalem, they are, which is to say the, 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 the very, very thing that one sees when one looks at what looks like gold, what looked like jasper, is the fire uh, is the reality of the presence of God. And red in the in Re book of Revelation, as in Ezekiel, is really the color of God, if you want to put it that way, because the color of God is the color of the fire, which symbolizes God. And so you can say that New Jerusalem, in a sense, can be imagined almost like the new version of the burning bush, fulfillment of that coming of God, in Exodus to free uh, people of Israel from Egyptian slavery, to come to dwell in them, that ends up being at the end of the history realized as God's presence in the very reality of the that encompasses the entire creation. And it's this presence that gives vibrancy, that gives um, uh, its character to, uh, to, that, uh, to that city. And this, uh, I want to suggest, is the end of God with creation and with uh, humanity. The God who came to Moses um, in Exodus, God, that God comes and dwells among uh, the people and within the people. And through that, um, the whole creation comes to its uh, fulfillment. Now, the task, I think, for the church is to participate in the mission of God, 
in order to receive oneself, its own being from God as such, and then to participate in the movement of the history, God's movement of history, God's moving history toward that end. Um, I think that's a very attractive vision for today. At least it is, uh, it, it is to me, I'm deeply persuaded uh, by a sense of at homeness of creation when God is present in creation. Thank you very much. And I hope um, this has been illuminating to you and can trigger an interesting discussion about what might this mean in our daily lives and in how we think uh, about not only life of the church, but also life in our societies. Thank you very much.